Thank you so much for joining us for CBN Newswatch. I'm Ephraim Graham. Ahead today, it could be a huge breakthrough in the Middle East as the White House is trying to work out a deal for Saudi Arabia and Israel to normalize relations. We're going to take a look at what the deal could include and the potential roadblocks along the way. The death toll in Hawaii is still climbing after last week's fire in Maui and could reach into the hundreds. We're going to hear about the relief efforts on the scene, including how CBN's Operation Blessing is providing some much-needed disaster relief. Training for the Space Force, how cadets at the Air Force Academy are learning to push the boundaries of the skies above us and produce more resources in space. And our Studio 5 conversation with Michael Orr. You saw his story in the hit film, The Blind Side. Now we're going to hear all about the lessons he's learned from a lifetime of adversity. All those stories and more are ahead today in CBN Newswatch. This is CBN Newswatch. We begin this half hour with an attempt at what could be a huge development in the Middle East. White House talks are set to begin this week on a deal in which Saudi Arabia and Israel would normalize relations. Under the proposal, the Saudis would recognize Israel in exchange for Israeli support for a Palestinian state and other concessions. But there are some major obstacles in the way of any agreement. CBN's Dale Hurd is on this story. Top Israeli officials are set to hold meetings at the White House after the U.S. and Saudi Arabia reportedly agreed to a broad outline for a deal in which Saudi Arabia would recognize Israel. But the Saudis are asking a lot, not only for Israeli help in the creation of an independent Palestinian state, but U.S. security guarantees and help creating a civilian nuclear program. White House National Security Council spokesman John Kirby, speaking off-camera in a virtual press briefing, said a deal is not close at hand. Quite frankly, just to, to be... Uh, blunt here. I think the, the reporting has left some people with the impression that uh, that discussions are farther along uh, and closer to some sense of certainty than they actually are. But former Israeli ambassador to the UN Danny Danone says he believes Saudi Arabia is likely to join the Abraham Accords and normalize ties with Israel within the next year. While former U.S. Ambassador to Israel Martin Indyk compared the complexity of the deal to a Rubik's cube. This three-way deal which is what it will be between Israel, the United States, and Saudi Arabia if it comes about. It's kind of like a Rubik's Cube. There's so many moving pieces uh, that have to be put into place in an intricate uh, diplomatic uh, dance. Dr. Ariel Cohen of the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center said all the demands made by the Saudis will make a deal difficult. The Saudis, the prince, he wanted nuclear technology with very few strings attached uh, to be provided to Saudi Arabia, enrichment um, of uranium. Uh, he wanted an ironclad guarantee that if Saudi Arabia is attacked by Iran, the United States will step in and go to war for the kingdom. Israeli opposition leader Yair Lapid has told U.S. lawmakers he opposes any normalization agreement, but Indyk says a deal is a high priority for all three governments. There is a a sense of urgency. And what's important about this is not only that the sense of urgency appears to be matched by the uh, Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, but of course it's matched by Prime Minister Netanyahu, which for him is one of his most important foreign policy priorities now. He can taste the possibility of peace between Israel and Saudi Arabia. The White House wants to complete the deal before the presidential election season heats up. Some think that's too soon and that any deal will have to wait until after the 2024 election. Dale Hurd, CBN News. We turn now to Hawaii, where one official fears the final death toll from last week's devastating fire in Maui could be at least several hundred people. As President Biden prepares to visit the area, aid agencies like Operation Blessing are ramping up their relief efforts. George Thomas brings us that story. As the search for survivors continues, some residents testifying how one left turn while escaping the burning inferno a week ago may have just saved their lives. It's very sad. Usually I'm hard-headed with my wife. Lord, direct our steps. Yeah. Wow. And my husband turned left. Turned left. And I'm so thankful. Thank you, Jesus. 
Dana Lucio, a licensed crisis care counselor who flew in from Oahu, knows there is going to be a lot of emotional struggle as survivors begin to deal with the trauma of what lies ahead. A lot of them are still experiencing some stress and some uh, shock factor. And so our goal is to just allow them to process what they're experiencing. 106 people dead so far, hundreds still unaccounted for. Maui officials beginning the painful task of identifying the dead, urging more survivors to provide DNA samples so they can account for those who didn't make it. President Biden expected to visit soon as FEMA and other agencies ramp up relief efforts. On the big island of Hawaii, Operation Blessing, teaming with Youth with a Mission, or YWAM, is focused on getting long-term supply items to those affected in Maui. Things like generators, gas grills, tents, tarps and rope, various pieces of clothing, diapers, flashlights and batteries. This ceramic filter can give up to 10,000 gallons of water. With officials warning Maui residents not to drink tap water in certain parts of the island, Operation Blessing purchasing water purification packs that will pump fresh water. This machine will give a thousand people a day drinking water if you run it around the clock. At this YWAM warehouse in Kona, relief supplies are being sorted, packed and readied for shipment. So the supplies are getting over to the island by every type of creative means you could think of. YWAM, which has had a base here in Kona for the last 50 years, is tapping their extensive network of churches and parachurch groups to get the most urgent items quickly to the folks in Maui. Initially, what we're doing is mobilizing through our different friends because of YWAM, we work with interdenominationally across the body of Christ and cross-culturally. Meanwhile, in Lahaina, survivors of last week's deadly fire, many of whom lost everything, doing what they can to help each other with donations. You know, and I consider myself a strong leader, but it broke me. It's, it still breaks me. This is what keeps me going, helping people. George Thomas, CBN News. And you can find out more about what Operation Blessing is doing in Hawaii and how you can help by visiting ob.org. Coming up, there is no limit in these skies. The technologies that make our world turn are deployed miles above the Earth. Satellites are used for cell phone signals, weather forecasts, bank transfers, and so much more. We're going to meet the cadets who work to protect these vital assets when we come back. The sky is indeed the limit for some cadets at the U.S. Air Force Academy. That's, that, that saying just doesn't apply. Those who are training to join the Space Force are learning to push the boundaries of an endless frontier. Their goals include producing resources in space and the hope of one day expanding mankind's horizons to live on other planets. Mark Martin brings us the story from Colorado Springs. The princess is scrolling. Cadet First Class James Ferran commands this operation. He and his crew check the health of a satellite, upload a list of instructions for it to follow, and download data. So, were there any issues with this? Not at all. That was the perfect pass. The U.S. Air Force Academy Falcon Sat program is just one aspect of a rigorous education path, transforming cadets like Ferran into Space Force officers. A nominal pass is what we always want. That's the great thing. However, the things that kind of excite me is when things aren't going perfectly and you have to problem solve on the spot. The cadets can actually build and operate and fly the satellites. And these satellites are, are not the, the QC satellites where we were just demonstrating a, a little technology. No, these satellites are performing a mission for the Air Force and the Space Force and other DOD customers. Colonel Luke Sauter says having a Space Force is critical to protect key U.S. interests in space and to ensure equal access for the nations of the world to utilize this frontier. Whether it's your cell phone and the GPS connection, whether it's the timing of your banking signals, whether it's the weather that you're expecting to see for the forecast in the next few days, space is everywhere. Well, if we're seeing our commercial assets going to space and the money and the benefit to the economy from a space economy, there's the advent that somebody else will want to also take advantage of that or maybe rob us of that advantage. That's where we need a space force to defend our equities in space. Sauter says cadets learn space by doing space. 
From classes in space war fighting and operations to the brand new summer azimuth program. From flying in the vomit comet and experiencing what weightlessness is like for real to doing some underwater immersion to actually getting a briefing and tours of all of this surrounding space infrastructure and architecture that we have in this area. It's a very rich area for the Space Force. The Academy also teaches astrobiology to build the science of growing food, plants, and other resources in space. We're building an astrobiology program very quickly that will incrementally do new and innovative experiments. And each one has a unique angle looking at different aspects of what biology means out in space and how that biology relays back to us here on Earth. Cadet fourth class Jordan Moore works to make the perfect mushroom. If we want independent space travel, right? We want to go to Mars, we want to go to the moons of Jupiter, right? We need to have a source of food that is able to be grown and be sustained without having Earth resources. Cadet second class Madeline Latendre plants mustard seeds in phytogel with the ultimate goal of producing plants that can grow in space without sunlight. It's super cool. I mean, this research project is new, and so it's really interesting to be at the start of something and see this process, the trial and error, and seeing the end goal being something um, super cool up in space. The Air Force Academy is the top commissioning source for Space Force officers. About 400 have graduated from the school since 2020, and the expectation is that around 10% of every graduating class will go into the newest branch of the military. Of our 40 cadet squadrons, we have five Air Officer Commandings who are Space Force uh, officers as well, and a group commander too. So we really, uh, I think, are doing a good job of embedding um, these Space Force leaders and mentors into just about every aspect of cadet life. And Colonel Sauter welcomes prayers for guidance. We have leadership that is trying to understand how to step forward into this new domain for the good of society and the good of the human population, expand our presence in space, expand to the moon and to Mars and to other locations, and really be able to leave this planet and become a multi-planet species. Cadet First Class James Ferran says having faith while executing a secular mission is right for him. He believes it's what he was charged to do. My mom would always say that before I was born, I was set apart. She would say that all the time. Hi, mom. Uh, but with that, I think that this is a, a calling of some kind. Um, and I don't think I can see myself anywhere else, honestly. Um, it's hard here. It's not easy. But I can't see myself at any other institution. And in a world where the sky's the limit, Space Force cadets becoming officers push that boundary, echoing their military branch's song, which says, there's no limit to our sky. Mark Martin, CBN News, Colorado Springs, Colorado. Still ahead, Michael Orr, whose story was told in the hit film, The Blind Side, went about how he went from homelessness to becoming a football star. We've got our Studio 5 conversation with him, plus the latest on the lawsuit he's filed against the family who took him in. We'll be right back. Welcome back to CBN News Watch. Former NFL star Michael Orr is making headlines this week with a lawsuit filed against the Tui family. He and the family were the subject of the hit film The Blind Side. But Orr is now speaking out against both. On the heels of the release of his new book, he's sharing lessons he's learned from a lifetime of adversity. Blanco, well, he was hit when he threw it. And Michael Orr, the rookie right tackle, caught it. Michael Orr beat the odds, rising from homeless on the streets of Memphis to enjoying eight seasons in the NFL as an offensive tackle for the Baltimore Ravens, the Tennessee Titans, and the Carolina Panthers until injury sidelined his football career in 2016. When I started this journey a long time ago, uh, I was just chasing to be comfortable after I was done with football. <laughs> my back was against the wall all my life. From the time I was three years old, my first memory is being homeless. Three to 10, that was in and out of foster care. 
shelters, on the streets. With a father lost to the prison system and a mother lost to drugs, Orr's orphan story is one many think they know. You remember a story in the papers a while back about a, a man who fell off an overpass? From the Academy Award-winning 2009 film, The Blind Side, inspired by Orr's life. Many of us came to know your story through the movie, The Blind Side. If you could go back and change, rewrite that movie in any way, what would you do? What's missing is a kid that, a kid that was already on a path and he was well on his way. And a lot of the hard work from, from three years old to 18 is when I moved in uh, with the family. Mm -hmm. In less than a year, and I was off to college. It was another family who uh, helped me along the way. Mm -hmm. Very grateful. Mm -hmm. A lot of hard work taken from me. It's more to the story, yeah. you know. And uh, holding back a little bit, and you'll 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 know more later mm -hmm. after this interview. But. And in the weeks following our interview, we learned at least some of the more to Orr's story. He filed a lawsuit against the Tui family, arguing the movie was a lie and he was misled into a conservatorship that allowed the family to make millions. Orr calls this a difficult situation for him and his family, but says the lawsuit speaks for itself and he has no further comment. Members of the Tui family call the lawsuit hurtful, devastating, outlandish, and absurd but pledge they'll continue loving Michael Orr. But it's about healing mm -hmm. and knowing who you are. Michael's legal battle comes as he opens up about his emotional battle, doing the work in therapy to heal adult and childhood trauma in order to be a better husband and father for his college sweetheart and their four children. How does that translate for you to fatherhood? You, you've got kids as well and you had a difficult childhood and now you're shepherding some young ones yourself. You no, know, for me, that was easy. Yeah. I've always wanted that, and I knew what I wanted, I, I was gonna do the total opposite of the things that I had to go through as a kid. You know, I wanted to be there for my kids. It's the greatest thing, joy in the world for me. Mm -hmm. Nothing's better. Uh, so, <laughs> just to know someone's counting on you, and you have to be there, you're mentoring, you're, uh, laying that foundation, uh, I mean, it's, I get mad at fathers that's not involved. <laughs> Understood. I can't stand it. Fatherhood and life after football is about leaving a legacy. Now, you have a new book, When Your Back's Against the Wall. This is the second book for you? Yes. What made you want to pen this book? I have a sense of duty to the other young kids out there like myself that's growing up, and mm -hmm. I'll be letting generation after generation down if I don't get out here, continue to spread my message, and let them know that you can be successful coming from where I came from uh, in whatever situation that you're in. My back has been against the wall all my life, from three years old to when I was my last year in the NFL. I wanted a diff different narrative for myself. Changing narratives and writing success stories is the inspiration behind Orr's latest project. And you have a foundation doing the work to inspire other young people like who face what you face. That, uh, it is. It's a, it's, a, it's a great feeling. I want the smartest kid, I want the most talented athletically, but I just wanted it and I was gonna be, I was disciplined and consistent. Just to sit down and actually meet someone like me, it was, it was the most inspiring thing ever. I'm like, man, I leave out, I have to get to work <laughs> because I wanna save all these kids. Oh, beautiful. I want all of them to come, to my, come through my foundation. And with that, this former footballer feels even more like the father he never had for his foundation's first class of students who begin this fall. Michael Orr's book, When Your Back is Against the Wall, is available now wherever books are sold. It's also available on audiobook.
Now, for more uplifting entertainment, be sure to join us tonight for an all-new edition of Studio 5. We're sitting down with actor Dennis Quaid, who's now flexing his music muscle with a new gospel project. We're also going inside a media merger that's bringing more faith and inspiration to multiple screens. And you will meet the filmmakers behind the project New World Order, Dark Prince. You can catch it all on Studio 5. That's on the CBN News Channel tonight at 830 Eastern. You can also watch it on the CBN News app or on YouTube. Coming up, it was called a genuine move of God as well more than 100 people came forward to be baptized at a church service this weekend. We're going to have that story when we come back. Stay with us. Download the CBN News app 24-7 News from a Christian perspective at home or on the road. One place for all of your news. Breaking news alerts. Set daily prayer goals and pray for news stories. Read the most important news and watch CBN News Channel Live. CBN News, because truth matters. Go to CBNNewsApp.com to get the app today. A Tennessee church reports a, quote, genuine move of God as more than 100 people came forward for Baptism Sunday. It happened at Long Hollow Baptist Church in Hendersonville, Tennessee. The church had to put one of its services on hold because so many people asked to be baptized. Only one person was scheduled for baptism, but the church reports 136 spontaneously came forward, including eight people watching online at home who drove to the church to make a public declaration of a new life in Christ. One man drove more than 300 miles to attend the service and he decided he'd get baptized as well. More people are scheduled to be baptized this Sunday. Beautiful. Well, time now for your Wednesday word and I just wanna leave you with this. In God, there is no failure. Success is the only option. You're either learning a lesson or enjoying a blessing, but know this, in God, you cannot fail. He's a man who cannot lie, and he's a God who cannot fail, and he wants nothing but success for you. Let that lesson be your lesson today. Well, that is going to do it for this edition of CBN News. Watch and remind you, you can always find more of our news programs on the CBN News channel. You can find them there at any time as well as online. That's CBNNews.com. We would love to know what you think about the stories you've seen here today or any day. You can email us. The address, newswatch at CBN.com. And, of course, you can always reach out and touch us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We love hearing from you. Please join us again right back here, same time tomorrow. Goodbye and God bless.